This video is going to be my genuine and honest review of the new paid mods added by Bethesda with the latest Skyrim update. I'll also shout out some free alternatives that you can use instead of these mods. So the new mods are added in the same way that the creations were with a credit system. The cheapest mod is 400 credits, but the minimum amount of credits you can buy is 750, which is £6 or $8. So at the very minimum, you're spending $8 for a mod, so keep that in mind as you watch. There are seven of these paid mods in total, which if you want to buy them all, will cost you $39.99 due to how the credit system is structured. We'll start with the smaller and cheaper ones and then move on to the more expensive and interesting ones. We'll start with the Old Mary Anti-Mage, priced at 400 credits. This is simply a new armor set that you can see Thalmor mages occasionally wearing. You can obtain it by either killing a Thalmor mage, you can sometimes find out patrolling, or by crafting it with the elven smithing perk. It's really nothing special in my opinion, and I can't recommend it considering there are similar armors available for free, like the traveling mage armor by Fuse00, which fits a more casual mage, or Zabbio's armor textures for elven armor, if you're looking for a more Thalmor themed armor set. Also considering that you have to spend £6 minimum to get the armor, means that I really couldn't recommend this to anyone. For another of the cheaper ones that I actually quite like, we have Katya the Thief, a follower mod that has 1200 lines of fully voiced dialogue by a professional voice actor. The backstory goes that Katya herself is a career criminal and a serial thief who's been caught by the guards one too many times. However this time you act as her knight in shining armour, saving her from the guards and giving her a chance at redemption. To actually get Katya as your follower, you'll need to complete a very small and easy quest in Whiterun. In the central market, you'll overhear Katya arguing with two guards. They want to take her in, she doesn't want to go, and your job is to simply tell the guards to leave her alone, which they will do for a small fee if you can't convince them. Once they're gone, you merely have to ask Katya to follow you as your repayment, and she will. Now Katya's a natural born thief, so is better suited to sneak archers rather than brutish warriors. She also has some custom features that make her unique. You can set where you want her home to be by asking her to go to a certain location once she's dismissed. You can ask her what's on her mind at any given moment. Gold, boss. And she'll also make comments depending on where you are and what you're doing, from fighting a dragon to simply going through a bandit cave. Not very good at robbing and thieving, I think. Should teach them. Another bonus of Katya is that she doesn't count as a normal follower, so she can tag along even if you have someone else following you, which unlocks her special interactions with your followers, like her unique conversations. I saw you steal that. Your nonsense. We are sisters of battle. I would be shamed into some god if I did such a thing. That's about all there is to say about this mod. All in all, it's a very solid follower mod. However, it still doesn't justify the price tag when mods like Lucian and Inigo are available for free and offer tons more content. Though if you particularly like her voice or personality, I think you can purchase this one without feeling scammed. Now moving up in price to 500 credits, we have the Shade Tree Lodge by Eleonora, who has many popular player homes, including Mere Watch from the Creation Club. Shade Tree is a new player home found in the Rift, just north of Lagishbur and west of Riften. The medium-sized home comes with named and unique storage for all the loot you find, tons of weapon and armor displays, as well as a secret hidden storage area hidden in the basement. There's also every crafting station you'd ever need, including a custom enchanting table and staff enchanter. Outside there's a stable for your horse, all the blacksmithing equipment, as well as a private fishing spot for all the anglers. This is certainly a great player home, though I don't know if it's worth the credits, especially considering that there are also literally hundreds of player homes available for free, like Ruska, which is really similar to Shade Tree Lodge and is made by the same author. So even if you're really desperate for a new home, I can't recommend buying this. Now I showed you Shade Tree Lodge before this one, despite it costing less, just to put the pricing into perspective. For 400 credits we have Legendary Dungeons Dwarven Delves, which adds two Dwarven themed dungeons from the Elder Scrolls Online into Skyrim. The dungeons are unique in the fact that each of the two have a separate secret dungeon within them. Let's first look at Stone Gardens, which you can find within Pineman Cave up in northern Skyrim. The lore of this dungeon is that an alchemist called Alar Ghost Bottle and his students have taken over the dungeon, intent on resurrecting a long dead legendary alchemist so they can steal his secrets. Though through all their necromantic rituals, they've awakened Dwemer spirits within the ruins that don't take too kindly to being disturbed. The dungeon is quite big, with it taking me about 25 minutes to run through. It has lots of branching pathways so it isn't completely linear, and if you're thorough in your exploration, you can acquire the pieces of the Mad Alchemist set, which is a really powerful alchemy boosting gear, as well as Ghost Bottle's unique poisoning weapons. Throughout the dungeon you'll face Ghost Bottle's disciples, which are just basic mage enemies, along with some spectral Dwemer, who seem slightly tougher than their normal counterparts. Once you've fought through the dungeon and defeated Ghost Bottle, you'll learn through reading his journal that to gain access to the spectral barrier he was guarding, you'll need to find and burn four samples of Dwarven Bone Dust, which you would have likely found along the way as I did. 
Once you burnt the bone dust, the barrier will open up into the Stone Crypts, the second dungeon. Stone Crypts is an extremely small but unique looking dungeon, with a major boss fight being three extremely tough dwarven automatons called the King Centurions. It actually took me a couple tries to beat the trio as they are very strong, though once you have beat them you can find royal bone dust on their corpses, which you can then burn to gain the ultimate reward being the King's Craft ability, which allows you to craft the armour of the King's Guard that has unique enchantments. Though that doesn't mean the dungeon's over, there are still likely secrets you didn't uncover like finding the unique Stormforge Axe, which says it has unlimited charges, yet it's bugged so when you use it instead of being always charged, it's never charged. Then moving on to the second of the dungeons, there's Frostfall. The backstory to this dungeon is that a group of high elven craftsmen have figured out how to unravel the secrets of the Dwemer, however the new power they're learning is starting to spiral out of control. The elves are ultimately trying to open the vault at the heart of the dungeon, which requires the activation of three mechanisms scattered throughout the ruin which after you kill the elves becomes your task to activate. Now traversing this dungeon is a little more involved, I actually found some of the sections to be quite maze-like, and I found it more fun to turn off the quest markers so I'd actually have to find where I'm going. The first mechanism I unlocked was in the Stormworks, which is a long series of halls filled with high elven mages and dwarven spiders they had allied. To unlock the second and third mechanisms you have to go through the Snowworks, which is a massive chasm connected to the Stormworks, and the Scorchworks, which is another offshoot filled with lava and fire. Once you've triggered all three mechanisms, you can enter the first part of the vault and face off against the leader of the elves. Then in classic Skyrim fashion, you can then read his journal to find out that to go deeper within the Frost Vault, you need to turn three more valves, which causes you to backtrack all the way back to the Stormworks, Snowworks and Scorchworks, which I can't say I'm a huge fan of as it feels like they were trying to pad out the runtime. Then once you have turned the valves and returned back to where you were, you can finally go deeper into the second dungeon within the Frost Vault, being the Drake Engine. From here you're doing more of the same, as to go further into the drake engine you have to find and turn two more valves, though once you have done that you can finally enter the wormworks, which is the final level that contains the grand boss of the dungeon, being Mofnak's Misery, an ancient dragon that was ruthlessly experimented on by the dwarves. Upon killing the dragon you can get your final reward being three new summoning spells, each of them summon a worm that each grant you a unique buff as well as aiding you in battle. All in all it took me over an hour to get through so it's likely the largest dungeon in the game, however that doesn't mean it was the best. The backtracking was tedious and the dungeon felt long to the point where it really didn't justify the reward. I definitely preferred playing through the stone gardens, though if you are a fan of long dungeon crawls you will likely enjoy your time with this mod. Moving up again to 600 credits, we'll now look at the Arquibus, which is my favourite mod out of the ones in this video. The mod adds a new quest which starts with you visiting a new Dwemer ruin, located just north of Cradle Crush Rock. Just outside the ruins you can find an abandoned imperial camp, and once you go inside you can find several journals that gradually get more bleak, detailing the failure of an imperial excavation into the ruin. The soldiers and workers quickly die off due to the dilapidated state of the ruin. As you journey deeper and deeper, the more the ruin crumbles and the more corpses you can find of the Imperials, with most of them being found at the Grand Lift that takes you down even further. Guarding the lift is a new enemy archetype, the Dwarven Arquebusia, that acts the same as a Dwarven Ballista, and instead of shooting bolts, it shoots exploding balls. Now for probably my favourite part of the dungeon is the lift itself. Upon entering you'll realise instantly that this is not a normal lift, as you actually have to watch your character go deeper and deeper. Then you get a new objective, being only to survive. Dwarven spiders will periodically climb out from the lift to attack you, and you have to stand your ground until you reach the bottom. But before you can, the lift crashes, leaving you stranded at the bottom, and with no option of retreat, you now have to press forward. Venturing further in and you have to fight through some more Duomo automatons, as well as the Falmer, until you reach a certain Imperial who got trapped beneath the ruins. Next to him is an Arquebus, the name of the mod which is a rudimentary type of gun that operates identically to crossbows, with the difference being that it shoots out bullet-like projectiles that explode on impact. Also next to the dead Imperial is his journal, which tells you that you'll need to activate four valves and reroute the steam flow within the pipes to go further into the ruin. After turning the valves and redirecting the steam, you'll eventually make it to the Grand Library, where you have to solve a small puzzle similar to that in the Tower of Mazark, which then unlocks a door containing the leader of the expedition and the captain of the soldiers. On the leader, you can find the schematics to craft the arquebus, as well as a control cube. Placing the cube in the socket in the centre of the room starts an onslaught of dwarven automatons attacking you, until the hulking overseer of the ruin appears as the final boss battle. It has tons of health and the ability to shoot a beam of electricity. Upon defeating the centurion you get your final reward, 
being your freedom, the unique calm from its verdict that shoots out a burst of steam that damages enemies even further, and the Arquebusia Staff, which lets you summon one of the new Dwarven Automatons at your will. Now that's not quite the end of the mod. Once you've chosen a side in the Civil War, and have completed the Jagged Crown quest, you'll receive a letter from either Galmar Stonefist or Legate Ricker, which I don't think anyone proofread, as if you side with the Imperials like I did, it's misspelled as Legate Ricky in the quest objective, the letter's name, and the letter itself. But anyways, the Legate asks you to report on your findings within the Ruin, as she never heard word back from the leader of the expedition. Here you have a choice, you can either lie to Ricker and say you didn't find anything within the Ruin, which comes with some buggy and unvoiced dialogue saying she doesn't believe you, but doesn't seem to care anyways. Or more interestingly, you can give her the schematics, which will cause the Arquebus to be added to the level list, so you can now see the Imperial soldiers wielding the guns. There are also some unique craftable variants of the Arquebus, being the Saber version, which is adorned with the Saber Cat's head, and the Dragon version, which is made out of dragon bone and has a dragon's head at the front. Despite its bugginess towards the end, I still very much enjoyed this mod. The dungeon is fun and not long to the point where it starts to get monotonous. And the new weapon type is very fun to use. However, available for free is the Law Friendly Guns of Skyrim mod, which adds in a very similar weapon type to the Arquebus with far more variety as it adds in rifles as well as pistols. Law Friendly Guns even comes with different ammo types like bullets that summon flaming familiars that attack your foes, poison bullets which erupt into a cloud that damages foes, flaming projectiles that shoot out an arc of flames, or you can even load your gun with a tentacle mass that paralyzes the target for a short time. In short, if you're only interested in the guns, buying Arquebus just isn't worth it. Now also for 600 credits we have Winterfrost Plus, probably one of the best and most customizable player homes I've ever seen. But before we can get access to the home, we have to do a small mini quest that starts in the Winking Skeever. On the bar you'll be able to find a note to an unnamed mercenary. The note itself talks of a manhole that bandits have been using to sneak supplies into. Naturally, it becomes your quest to investigate. The manhole cover is located on an island near to a ship called the Dainty Slowed. Going down the hold leads to a large cave system used by bandit smugglers. For some reason there's a dragon bone sword in here with a really powerful enchantment, even though you can access the quest at any level. But just beyond the sword there's a trap door which leads you to Winterfrost. Now when you first arrive the house appears a bit neglected. You'll need to shovel the snow from the door and build a boat on the docks that you can use to go to and from solitude at any time. Now when you first actually go inside the home it will be all dark. That's because all the interior lighting can be toggled on and off by interacting with the chandeliers. Moving downstairs is the main living room that mainly just has an oven and cooking pot. In the bedroom there's an alchemy and enchanting table that comes with custom storage for your soul gems and potions. And at the back of the room is probably the most interesting feature of the mod being the Book of Alteration. Using the book you can customise what material your floor is made out of, what the walls inside the home look like, as well as the colour of your bedding. You can also take out any of these wall decorations off the wall and store your notes, scrolls and shoes in the custom storage containers. For the last room in the house there's an armory with loads of mannequins and weapon racks as well as some customizable elements. You can build displays to store your dragon priest mask which I noticed for some reason is missing a spot for Vakun's mask which I assume is just a mistake or bug. You can craft stands to put all your dragon claws, special helmets, unique bows, rare daggers and other special items. That's about all there is inside the house, but also outside there are all the blacksmithing tools, a wood chopping block, and plenty of storage for all your raw materials. It reminded me a lot of the Elysium Estate, which is of course available for free, and comes with all the same amenities being unique storage, a large area for you to store all your unique items, and all the crafting stations you will ever need. So now let's move on to the big one, the most expensive one at 700 credits, being the East Empire Expansion. Now this one is quite complex and has multiple components, so we'll first look at how to actually start it. Once you've cleared any dungeon out in the wild, you might be approached by a Khajiit named Shakar. However, in my playthrough, I'm fairly certain it bugged, as I was approached randomly just outside of Right Run, even though the quest claims Shakar saw me exit the Frost Vaults, which are near to Windhelm. Anyways, Shakar offers you a service, in that every time you clear a dungeon, instead of you hauling out all the loot yourself, you could place an East Empire Company relic in a container within the dungeon. Then you place all your loot you want to keep in that container, then a courier will pick up all the items and deliver it to a certain East Empire Company checkpoint, so you don't have to move all the gear yourself. Now when I tried this for the first time of course it bugged out, and Chakar insisted that he had delivered the loot to the checkpoint even though the chest was empty, so I had to reload a previous save and this time it did work. All the items I wanted were delivered. After you get your items delivered for the first time, Shakar will offer another service, selling your goods directly to the East Empire Company. To do so, all you have to do is speak to a merchant that constantly stands next to the checkpoint, and after some time has passed, you'll receive your gold in a strong box at the East Empire Company checkpoint. 
Now to unlock the next part of the mod, you have to do a small quest for the High Elf Corrin, who Shukar actually sends you to. Corrin wants to expand to all the other holds, rather than just their lone checkpoint in Whiterun, and is trying to negotiate with the Jarls of each. He's had a meeting set up with the Jarl of Winterhold, and he thinks that we'd do a better job at negotiating than he would. Corrin offers a new service if you successfully convince Jarl Korra to let the East Empire Company expand their operations into Winterhold. As as well as a new outpost being set up in Winterhold, whenever you clear a dungeon in the hold, East Empire Company workers will come and extract all the resources from the dungeon. You then get a cut of all the materials. You can either have them delivered to the nearest outpost of the materials themselves, or you can have them be automatically sold for a cut of gold. So you're essentially getting free gold for what you'd already be doing, which is clearing out dungeons. You can then do the same in the other holds, by convincing the other 8 Jarls to give the East Empire Company permission to set up a new checkpoint and extract the resources from the dungeon to clear. I hope that all made sense as that was my understanding of the mod. It's not something I would ever personally use, even if it was free, but I'm sure some of you could enjoy it. All the NPCs are fully voiced and do a good job of it, and I honestly don't really know of a mod that fulfills the same role as this one. It's quite unique, and I guess that's why it's the most expensive. Well that's all 7 paid mods, let me know what you thought of the mods, as well as just your thoughts on paid mods in general. Thanks for watching.